one of my sisters and brothers could the congregation please stand. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The hour is coming, and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who care will live. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we shall carry nothing out. The Lord is the Lord and the Lord.
Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. God is great, it is that so. God is great, God is wonderful. And as we are gathered here today, my sisters and brothers, we are not gathered here as persons without hope. We are not gathered here thinking that, boy, I wonder if Sister Welsh's soul was right. We are gathered here because we have hope in him that she lived and she served her God faithfully. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning. And indeed, Lord, even as we have just sung how great the waters. Father, we know that you are great. Because we have we have witnessed your greatness, Lord, in so many different ways. Father, all we have to do is just look around us at creation in all its fullness. And we can see that it is only a God who is great, a God who is powerful, who could have created all the things that are around us. And so as we are gathered here this morning, O oh God, we first of all want to praise and to bless your holy name. Lord, we are gathered in the service of thanksgiving today, giving you thanks and giving you praise, Almighty God, for the wonderful things that you have been able to accomplish, O oh God. For the wonderful things, Lord, we ourselves would have experienced, even as we have a journey on this earth. We are gathered in this service today, O oh God, to once more praise and to worship your holy name, even as our departed sister would have done all of the days of her life. And so we pray, Almighty God, that even as we worship and we reflect today on her life, that truly, O oh God, from our own lips will come forth much praise and adoration of you. And so we pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will take charge of today's service of thanksgiving. We pray that once more your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts, that once more, God, even as we go through this service today, that we will hear you speaking loud and clearly to us, O God, through all the various elements of this worship. And so if your hands, O God, we place ourselves. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. May you take control of this service today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Most gracious and eternal God, we turn to you with the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace, so that even as we mourn the death of one whom we knew and loved, we may not be overcome by this trial, but we may hold fast, trusting in your goodness and mercy. Assure us, O oh Lord, O oh God, that death is not the end of those who trust in you. And may our hearts be so composed in the Holy Spirit that all fear and bitterness may be swallowed up in the light and peace you gave to your troubled children. Almighty and eternal God, who by the Holy Spirit minister to us in our weakness, and by the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, have given us the pledge of eternal life. Lift us, we pray, above our present distress and sorrow, and shed the light of your grace and glory upon us, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. My sisters and my brothers, we are met this morning in this solemn moment to commend Hazel Welsh into the hands of the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer, by whose stripes we are healed, and in whose name alone we have salvation. Let us then recall to mind the life of our their departed sister, and in humble trust, hear the words of the Holy Scriptures. We will first of all be listening to the scripture reading from Psalm 91 to 12. This will be read by 
Audrey Ferguson Friend. Following this, we will have the written tribute from the St. James Methodist Church. Now, there, there, is, there are three more spaces allotted for tributes. And so if there's anybody else inside here who may wish to reflect on the life of our sister, you are free to do so. We usually don't take open tributes, but the space is there in this order today. So if you wish to say something regarding the life of our dear sister, there are three spaces available in the tribute section. Ms. Ferguson, could you come forward, please? Good morning. The first lesson is taken from Psalm 90, verses 1 to 12. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or even thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and saidst, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in my sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with the flood. They are as asleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. For all of our days are passed away in the wrath, we spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Last verse. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Amen. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Mepen Methodist Church family, I take it a great pleasure to offer sincere condolence to the members of the bereaved family. And to my brothers and sisters, for me, it is a pleasure to read this short tribute in honor of our sister. I'll begin by mentioning to you something I overheard some time ago. I attended a meeting, and while I was waiting for the meeting to begin, I heard two men sitting on the opposite side talking about the church, church activities, and what should happen in the church and what shouldn't happen. I wasn't eavesdropping. But then, when I heard one say, but church people, my ears picked up because I wanted to hear what the other words would be. And this was what the man said to his friend. You know something? Church people must always wear working clothes. I smiled when I heard because I knew exactly what the man meant. And I'm quite sure that all of you here understand what the man meant when he said so. And so my brothers and sisters, not long after our sister Hazel Welsh joined us in this church family, by her deeds, by her words, by her actions, she proved to us that not only was she a practicing Christian, but she was a Christian who wore church clothes. Because, you see, she never waited to be called to do anything at all in this church. She always volunteered her services, and she put her whole heart in everything that she had to do and she did it very well, not thinking about the praises that she would receive from her fellow members, but she did it all for unto the glory of Almighty God. And so 
that was the beginning of the work and worth of our sister Hazel Welsh. We place on record to her invaluable services in all the activities of the church and many of the successes that we gained were due to the help, the support, and the cooperation that she offered. Similarly, her punctuality and regularity in her attendance for worship services is worthy of mention. She never missed a Sunday if Sister Welch's presence was not seen around the back there, we knew that something was wrong. And I will recall one Sunday morning, we did not see her. And many of us decided that we would go to visit her because we thought that she was ill. And before the service was ended that morning, we saw her coming right along that path with a scowl on her face, something that we had never seen before. And when she came in, she bowed her head and she prayed. And she held up her head, and then she did like this. She shook her head. At the end of the service, she explained to us that she got ready to be on time for worship service, but the taxi man forgot to pick her up, and that is why she was late. That was Sister Welsh. She had a concern that she should come to worship service because the worship of God was her priority. My brothers and sisters, furthermore, on entering the sanctuary, she never sat and warmed the benches, as we would say. She participated by reading the scriptures regularly. She was one of the first to stand when it was time for giving testimonies. She participated heartily in the praise and worship. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, her hallelujahs were louder th than the many voices that were here singing because her heart was so full of praise and thanksgiving that she had to let it out. My brothers and sisters, when it was time to pray, whether in the church or if someone had a problem, she was the first to offer prayers for that person. And so, throughout her life, throughout her ministry here, throughout her interactions with all of us here, she remained faithful, she remained committed, and she remained punctual in all she did and always strived to be excellent in everything she said and done. When a failing health took a hold of her body, with the aid of a cane, she continued to attend worship services and she continued to do those activities that she usually did and she continued to shout as she usually shouted. And this continued until when further challenges took a hold of her body and she was not able to use the cane anymore. She came in a wheelchair and one would have thought that this is the end, but not for Sister Welsh. She continued to pray. And with the aid of her microphone, she sat right there and she read the scripture lessons. She sat right there and she joined heartily 
in the praise and worship ex um, exercises that we had. And there were other activities that she usually did because of failing health. She was not able to do all of them, but she continued to do some. What a woman. What a Christian. What a woman. What a worthy Christian. One who continued to work, to wear working clothes. My brothers and sisters, we have many fond memories of Sister Welsh. I will just share a few because I know that there are others who are willing and who are ready to come up and say their piece. But I will just bring to our memory that in all of these challenges, Sister Welsh remains steadfast and committed and faithful to her God. And so during her time of fellowship with us, there are certain things that we will not forget. One of the things is that she went around with her palms open, not to receive, but to give. And for that, we will always remember her for her generosity in her giving, in her loving, and everything else that you can think of. We will remember her invaluable support to the Fishers of Men ministry, of this church, of which she took a great interest. In the prayer and fasting ministry, being held here on Wednesdays, she was never absent, and she was never late, and she gave with her full support. My brothers and sisters, we can never forget the many times she accompanied us on our trips to worship services in Kingston and other parts of the island. And I will just pause to tell you this because this is not a service where we are, we are sorrowful. We can smile. And so I'm going to share this with you. Whenever there is a trip to Kingston or anywhere else, and someone would go to her and say, Sister Welsh, or some of us call her Welshy. Welshy, we have been a trip to Kingston. You want to go? She would put her hands akimbo. Want to take this thing for? Me own what me no call, you know. So no just write down my name. And so my brothers and sisters, she would always accompany us. And there was one thing that was very outstanding about her. She never carried refreshment for herself. She always carried a very big bag filled with something that could last, maybe I would say, for a multitude because she was so caring, so loving, so generous, and so giving. However, there is something else that we cannot forget. When it is harvest time, those persons who have a craving for fried fish, ginger beer, and gizadas. Their taste buds come to life when they see that bucket and that tray. They just glimpse it, you know, they don't see her yet, but they know that it's Sister Welsh who is coming and that their needs would be supplied. And so, my brothers and sisters, we might think that Sister Welsh was just an ordinary woman. She was someone who was full of humor, too, you know. I can recall once she and I had a conversation, and I don't know where it led to, but she told me that when she was a young woman, she owned a lady's wheel bicycle. And she said, when I, had my, when I have my business today, you know, when you see me hold the bicycle and take that pedal mount, a gone like bending breeze. <laughs> and so after saying that, she would laugh loudly. And then one of the times she said to me, Sister T, you can ride bicycle. I said to her, yes, I learned to ride, but I didn't learn to take the pedal mount. So she said, then, then how you go up on the bicycle? When I told her, and I, I will not tell you, <laughs> when I told her, she said, eh, eh. 
a foolishness that you are doing. You, somebody can, in fact, you can ride bicycle because if you ride bicycle, you have to take pedal mount. So I sheepishly held down my head and I had to agree with her that I was not an accomplished cyclist as she was at that time. And so my brothers and sisters, when her health really failed and she couldn't be with us, we were saddened by the fact. But many of us still kept in touch with her by phone. Some made visits, but we always kept her in our prayers, remembering her for her great generosity. And how can I forget that she was not only generous to her, her church family, our strangers, but she always remembered her minister. Unfortunately, our minister came when her health had failed and she was not with us again, but she made her minister feel very wanted and feel very comfortable. And so my brothers and sisters, Sister Welsh has left a legacy behind, a legacy of committed service to her master, a legacy of service to her brothers and sisters of the church, and many lessons from which we can learn. And so as we celebrate her memory this morning, let us try to remember all those lovely things that she said and did. Let us remember the life that she lived and the examples that she has set for us to follow. And as we reflect on all that she said and all that she did, let us recall to mind those of us who know this song which says, if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can tell somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring back beauty to a world of rot, if I can tell love's message as a master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Our sister's living was not in vain. She made her mark here, and now she has gone to rest. And so to all of us who knew her, loved her well, we say, Aunt Hazel, Welshy, Sister Welsh, Miss Hazel, or whatever nicknames or whatever you used to call her. Thank you for the life that you lived and for the example that you have set for us to follow. Rest in peace. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I do not intend to add to what Sister Thomas has said because I think she has covered the grounds very well. For those who know Sister Hazel and have worked with her and have seen her work, the testimony given by Sister Thomas is true and faithful. But I'm here to just add one little word on behalf of the ministers who occupy the manse up in the bush there. Sister Welsh was a kind, loving mother to the manse families. And sometimes you would see her struggling with a bag on the long walk from here up to the manse because she never visited without something in her hands. And sometimes when the pain in the hip or the leg, I don't know where, but Sister Welsh would manage and she would still walk the distance until one of the boys or somebody up there would see her and come to her aid. So on behalf of the man's family, particularly Reverend Lindsay Richardson, I have been asked to say thank you, Sister Hazel, 
for your kindness, your love, and your support. And a message that I got that the tea set, bone china or crystal or whatever it was, will be cherished for the rest of their lives. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm remembering the life of Mrs. Hazel Welch. Aunt Hazel, cousin Vanny, sister Welch, Welchie, and Ba Miss Vanny was affectionately called. Those were the names that were affectionately called by her loved ones. When growing up in Johnsall as a little girl, I can recall Aunt Hazel coming from America and holidays mostly during the Christmas season. Her mother would say, girl, Vanny coming down for Christmas, don't tell anyone. That secret would be short-lived because I had to tell Winsome, or cousin and neighbor, to get the ex extra help in preparing for Aunt Hazel's arrival. Raleigh would be held in December at the Methodist Church in Johnsall, where she would attend with us. Christmas morning would be awakened by the sound of the church bell where we would attend Christmas morning service. Shortly after, her mother would prepare the meals while Aunt Hazel laid the table. It was a perfect, it was a picture perfect one. In addition, she would, she was very well spoken. I could remember one day playing in the yard with the girls. And I shouted, girl, catch the ball. Aunt Hazel overheard <laughs> me. And with a stern voice, she said, Carol, I know you can do better. Speak properly. So we had a big laugh. Leaving John Zoll, she went to Spanish Town to spend a few days with her Auntie Tiny before leaving to America. We would carry our homemade chocolate, gunga peas, pica pepper peas, etc. to take for her to take home. She went back to America and even though I was sad, I remember the saying and she always say all good things must come to an end. After the passing of her stepfather, Mr. Shirley Pennycook, that is my grandfather, she took an early retirement to take care for her ailing mother in Maypen, where she resided. I would visit them on several occasions to help them with the care of Miss Alma. After her mother passed, we came to live with her in 1996. One of my daughters, that's Lavon, she's to my right, was born in Maypen here. She treated her like a granddaughter. In addition, she instilled her values, which was maintained even to this day. To say Aunt Hazel was an amazing cook and baker would be an understatement. Her cooking could be smelled from afar off, tantalizing your taste buds one seasoning at a time. Even now, <laughs> my mouth is watering thinking about her escobies fish which she would bring to church for harvest, along with gizada, drops, tire leaf, also known as blue jaws or dukunu. How could I forget her signature drink? The, Mrs. Thomas, Ms. Thomas, you said it, the ginger bear. I recall her two huge red and yellow bucket, which she packed with ice and placed the bottles of gin, ginger bear in. Speaking of church, she would never miss any fasting, prayer, or church service. Even when she had physical challenges, she would be assisted by her driver, one of them, Sian, and her church family. Brother, one of them is Brother Cook, I can remember. Aunt, Brother Cook, sorry. And yeah, Brother Nick would also assist. I'm not gonna call names because I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Aunt Aza was also a fashionista. She would, fashionista, sorry, she would affirm herself in, adorn herself in jewelry, lipstick, and matching clothes. Similarly, she looked 
she loved her manicure and pedicure. I could remember one day doing her pedicure and my daughter Lavon came to her and she named one of the big toe. The left one is was um Gigi. Gigi. And the right the left one Gigi and the right one Shalom. And she loved that. Whenever time she sit, she would come there and pamper her her, her, her feet and she always smiled. Yes. Her love for a good perfume was passed on to my daughter and I as always smell aromatic. We remain, what remained a mystery to her was tardiness. She would not understand Jamaican people and time. She would get up two hours early and we would assist her. Her outfit would be selected and ironed the day before. I remember one day coming to church morning. I didn't want them to leave me. Leave me. And one, as I um, was coming in here, she looked at my dress and said, Carol, that dress doesn't iron. I said, Aunt Hazel, it can be worn that way. And she was, I don't know, she was so vexed. And then I said to her, she said, Carol, you should iron that dress. I said, Aunt Hazel, crush cotton. And there <laughs> she ended. Yes. Yes, she could be upset when an event, even event at seven, and does not begin exactly seven. As expected, she would be there half an hour before the start, and would often say the early bird catches the most worm. She loved to travel. If there was a church event, Miss Vanny would there, be there from from Funerals Golden Age Club meeting down by the New Testament Church of God at 57 Manchester Avenue, Synod, summer beach traveling trips, and visit Auntie Maggie in New York during the summer holidays. I recall her telling the many countries that she traveled, for example, the Bahamas, London, and Paris, France. Even with all that exploring, she never went to bed without doing her devotion, and I love to hear her pray. I would go on, and there are many memories. I could go on and on, but there are many memories, but I have to stop here. Mm -hmm. May her soul rest in peace, and light perpetual shine upon her. Sleep on, Aunt Hazel. Um, I want to just greet Pastor Reverend. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, let me move this up a little. Uh, to all the members here, greetings. Uh, thank you for just this opportunity. Thank you for just loving my aunt um, in the way that you guys did. Okay. Um, I'm truly honored to be here today. Um, she lived a good life. I know on books it's 98, but she's born in December. There's four of us that are born in December. And she was born in December, so she's actually 99 years old. And I just give God the glory for that. Um, I heard Carol talk about prayer. You know, the scripture says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we were fervent in prayer, constantly, our family. And so I stand here this, after, this morning on behalf of her sister, Winsome Marshall, who is in New York, um, not well at this time, the nieces, the nephews, the grands, I stand just to represent myself and Doreen and Altia is here because we are here in Jamaica. Um, the rest, everyone else is abroad and so we are here. And I just want to share, um, I asked the Lord, I said, God, what are we going to do? Because I recognize Reverend that we can't do nothing without him. <laughs> And he gave me the scripture in Ezekiel 3, verse 11 through 15. Um, this, this scripture reminds us of God's works, 
our eternity and cannot be changed or altered by anything. We can trust in his plans and purpose for our lives. And the scripture goes like this. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. And my aunt was beautiful in her own rights. He has, he has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So I conclude, there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. What is happening now has happened before. And, with, and what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes the same things happen over and over. This is from the, um, um, the New Living Translation. And I read this because um, God knows this time. We all have a time. Um, and if we don't know, if we, it is just to, as I look around, you know, if you don't know him as your personal savior, it is important to have that fellowship with God. It is important to know him as your friend. And my aunt did, she knew, even though she had a little ways. Bless you, Jesus, right, Terrence? Right, Carol? I can call your names. Um, aunt Hazel plan and purpose was set by God. She would be a part of our family. God knew that she was gonna be a part of our family. Because that's how he did it. Each of you have family and you are part of a special family because that's how God does it. He makes no mistakes in who he puts together and I was honored to know that she was a part of our family. Um, I just want to say to the church family here, I want to thank you for loving my aunt and for supporting her always, always supporting her. I just want to say thank you so much to Terrence and those persons who stood beside him to help him. Because my aunt already decided, decided, told the whole family that Terrence is gonna be the one to take care of her. And so everybody back down. And I just wanna thank you, Terrence, for your love and your care towards my aunt. And to my cousin, <laughs> Carol behind me, um, she was a lookout person because, you know, we weren't here. And so she for afforded us the opportunity to be able to pray with her, have video chats. Um, um, the family is like, they're like in a little state now because they're concerned about Carol. And we all are um, because she was there constantly constantly there and um, I just want you to know that I love you Donovan and my baby girls I love you Levon thank you so much for being the ears and the eyes for auntie um, you know I just I want to applaud Terrence and I want to applaud you as well for just doing all that you have done and I pray that God will bless you both. And for all of those who stood beside her, I don't want to, you know, I just, these are the two persons that were, that we were close to while I was very close to Carol. And so we knew about Terrence because of Auntie. But I thank God that he knows the plan, he knows the purpose for each and every one of us. And he has designated someone to look out for us. And I just give God the praise and glory 
for what he's doing. I love you guys. Love you so much, the church. I guess I really have to come back and visit. <laughs> I was a Methodist. I, you know, I used to be a Methodist. We were all Methodist. Um, but I branched out. Um, wanted a little bit more, but I thank God that God is just it's only one God. And because there's only one God, there's one faith, one hope. And so God bless you all. Thank you so much for this time. At this time, we will have the eulogy, which will be read by Lavon Francis, grand niece. Family, friends, church sisters, and brothers. Thank you for joining us this afternoon to celebrate the life of Hazel Marshall Welch. Born Hazel Marshall on the 10th of March, 1926, to parents Elma Lindsay and Jocelyn Marshall in Johns Hall, Clarendon. She attended Johns Hall Elementary School. After graduating, she was sent by her mom to live with her aunt-in-law in Red Hills, Clarendon where she attempted to learn dressmaking. She later returned to John's Hall and became a babysitter for a Methodist minister in Poros, Manchester. She later re resigned from babysitting to become a cook at Bernard Lodge Estate in St. Catherine. This is where she became a culinary master, excelling in the field of cooking and baking. Her plates, her breads and Christmas cake were scrumptious and were easily detected by the smell from a distance away. Her menu on Sundays was very tasty and delicious as a large variety of different food was served. Everyone looked forward to even a small serving of her Christmas dinner and desserts. This made her residence the place to be during the festive Christmas season. While working at Bernal Lodge Estate in St. Catherine, she met and fell in love with Roy Welch. Roy and Hazel tied the knot in 1965. This marriage did not last and ended in divorce. However, she, did, she decided to keep the last name Welch. Aunt Hazel migrated to the United States of America in August 1967, where she worked as a domestic helper for a few years. Then she went to school where she studied nursing and obtained her license as a certified nursing assistant. She worked as a CNA at the Kingsbrook Hospital. She, looked, she took an early retirement from her job as a CNA and returned to Jamaica to take care of her dear mother, Mrs. Elma Pennicook. Aunt Hazel was an elegant, outspoken, fashionable, and sociable individual who seized every opportunity to attend church and social events, even when she had a physical condition. Aunt Hazel believed in service to others. As such, she was a part of the Golden Age Club. She was also an active member of this church, St. James Methodist Church, where she took part in various church activities over the years until she became homebound. She died leaving one sister, Winsome Marshall, currently residing in Long Island, New York, a stepbrother, Clement Pennycook, living in New York, a host of nieces and nephews. Her siblings were unable to attend due to health challenges, but they sent their love for this Thanksgiving service. Aunt Hazel passed away on the 4th of March, 2024, at approximately 1.30 p.m. after many struggles with health challenges. Thank you, Lord, for lending Aunt Hazel to us for 96 long years. I would like to thank each and everyone who provided assistance to her in one way or another. Special thanks to her caregivers for the unconditional love and care you have provided, dear Aunt Hazel. Especially Miss Sharon, who was with her until the time of her passing. To the St. J. Methodist Church family, thank you for providing pastoral care to Sister Welch over the years. May God continue to bless this family. Aunt Hazel, your physical presence may, not, may be absent, but your love continues to surround us. Your laughter continues to echo in our hearts. Your memory will continue to comfort us. 
you will be missed. Your love and your light will forever shine bright in our hearts. Rest in peace and rise in glory and Jesus. God bless you all. We will continue with the offertory hymn, How Can I Say Thanks for the Things You Have Done for Me, Things So Undeserved, Yet You Gave to Prove Your Love for Me, the voices of a thousand million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to the 169 in the Voices in Praise. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you give to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude or the
Father the Lord, to God to be the glory for the things He has done. We worship you, God. We give you praise, O oh God. Father, we give you thanks indeed this day for the wonderful things, O oh God, you have done for our dear sister Hazel. We give you thanks, O oh God that even from she was conceived in her mother's womb, you knew her, O oh God. Father, you knew what she would have accomplished in her life. And so, dear God, indeed, we give you the glory this day because she lived the life you gave to her, O oh God, a life of service. She lived it in commitment to you, O oh God. Father, hers was a life that was not lived unto herself, but, Father, she gave to others. And so, dear God, even as we have listened to the tributes, we give you thanks, Lord, for the provisions that you would have made for her so that in turn, oh God, she was able to extend her hand to other persons. Father, even as we ourselves extend our hand to you this day and we offer to you, oh God, these monetary gifts, we pray, dear God, that you will use us and the gifts we offer to your honor, your glory, and your praise. And may your name be glorified here in this place today, O oh God, even as we know that it is being glorified in heaven. This I pray, and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Please be seated. We will continue with the reading of the second lesson to be read from Revelation chapter 14, 12 through to 16. I invite... Daphne Clayton, JP, to come forward at this time. Good afternoon, everyone. Here is the reading of a portion of God's word. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labor. And their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one sat upon the, one sat like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the, on the cloud, Thrust thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. 16 and last, and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on this earth, and the earth was reaped. Here endeth a portion of God's word. Thanks be to God.
St. Mark chapter 13, and I will begin to read from verse 32 through to 37. But about that day or or no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly." And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the gospel of Christ. Please remain standing if you're able. if when you give the best of your service if when you give the best of your service tell in the world that the Savior is come be not dismayed when men don't believe you he'll understand and say well done. Oh, when I come to the end of my journey, weary of life and the battle is won, carry the stuff and the cross of redemption. He Oh, 
Lord. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Father, we thank you for your presence in this act of worship today, O oh God. Father, we thank you for the timely reminders that we have been given throughout this worship experience, O oh God. Father, indeed, it is our desire that one day when we stand before you, that you will say, well done. And so, dear God, we pray that even as you continue to speak to us this day, that we will have that determination, O oh God, that we are going to live our lives for you, that we are going to live the rest of our lives, O oh God, in communion with you, so that at the end, you will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, bless me the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together. May they be found acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Today, my sisters and brothers, as we are gathered in this service of thanksgiving for our dear departed sister, Sister Hazel Welsh, I wish to speak to us from Mark 13, verse 33. And it says, Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. Today we are gathered here in this service of thanksgiving for dear departed Sister Welsh. Sister Welsh, as we have heard, is someone who lived a life devoted to Almighty God, not just a part of her life, but she lived this life to the very end. For those of her, us who would have seen her um, to the very end, some of us a day apart, others perhaps were with her the, the next day, we realize that she was someone who was really devoted to God to the very end of her life. Her life was spent in active service to Almighty God, who was indeed her shield and her buckler, a God whom she never ceased to offer her praise and her worship to. Even in her latter days, as you would have heard through the tributes, when she was confined to a wheelchair, Sister Welsh was present here in this church at worship and Wednesday morning prayer and fasting sessions. I came here 2019, just some months before the COVID pandemic. And so when I met Sister Welsh 2019, she was still very much coming to church in her wheelchair. She was still present at the prayer and fasting sessions here on a Wednesday morning. It was only during the pandemic itself when it was said that the elderly should remain home and then there were restrictions in terms of how many persons could attend worship that Sister Welsh actually stopped. Her favorite chorus that um, she oftentimes would sing was when I think of the goodness of Jesus and what he has done for me, my soul cries out hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. And I remember the, the prior to the, the last time I saw her, that we sang that chorus right there at her home as well. And on that particular visit, I still remember it, that Sister Welsh, um, she talked, she talked, she talked. And for those of us who were familiar with her know that she was a very good speaker. And so she spoke and she spoke and she spoke and I literally had to pull myself away that particular day. But hers was a life in which she continuously spoke about the goodness of Jesus. And you know, my dear sisters and brothers, there are many who are able-bodied, 
who do not find the time to engage in these spiritual disciplines, but Sister Welsh did. She came in her wheelchair. The wheelchair did not prevent her from assembling here with her brothers and sisters to give God thanks and praise. And she would position herself right over there in that corner over there, and that is where she would receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. That is where she would sit in her chair and she would worship Almighty God. She came because she recognized how good God was to her. And she responded with deep devotion and gratitude to Almighty God. Life reflected what John Wesley would have written in one of his hymns, I'll praise my maker while I have breath. When Sister Welsh died, she was not caught off guard. Her life was lived in preparation for that moment when death would come. She kept awake, and so when that time came, she was ready. She was vigilant. She did what Mark 13 instructed us to do. In the passage from Mark 13, we see the themes of watchfulness, preparation, and readiness in Jesus' discourse. In this life, we wait for many things, some of which are so routine that we give them no second thought, while others, um, we need much preparation for them. In our planning and preparation for future events, we are able to set a specific date. For example, when we met to plan this um, service of Thanksgiving, we were able to set a date for it and work towards it. However, there are certain things that require vigilance and daily preparation because we know not the day or the hour of their coming into our lives. Jesus' parable of the doorkeeper in the scripture read earlier on, challenges us to be always watchful as we await the coming of the Lord. The master of the house mentioned in the passage is referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus left us here on this earth to carry out his mission, spreading the good news of the gospel and winning souls for his kingdom. Like that master in the story, my dear sisters and brothers, he will return, and we are to be ready for his return. We are to keep awake and be alert, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that we do not expect. Clearly, the scripture is speaking to the second coming of Christ. The first advent of our Lord was a mission of grace. But according to scripture, Jesus' second coming is a mission of judgment. It is a time that the scripture speaks about, a time to separate the wheat from the tares. It is a time to test each person's works by fire. It is this we are to be ready for. In Luke 12, we, we read a parable about a man who stored up possessions for himself, only to have God say to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So regardless of whether we live to witness the second coming of Christ, we will witness a type of coming of Christ when we die. And so the question remains, are you ready? Are you ready? If Christ should come today, my dear friends, would you be satisfied with how you have lived for him? Are you ready for the return of Jesus? Are you ready? Are you prepared for death? We know that Death is coming one day. We know that Jesus is coming again. And that is the thrust of the verses we have read today. Let's look into these verses 
as we do examine our hearts to see if we are ready for his coming. You see, my dear friends, when the Lord returns, he is coming for a certain class of people, those who are ready to go. How well are you living out your commitment to Christ? Are you dressed for action? Is your, your lamp lit? Perhaps it would be easier to remain alert if we knew when he was coming. Isn't that so? It would be so much easier if we could just take up our schedules and put December 25th, the Lord will be coming. Wouldn't that be so easy? Imagine picking out the Sunday paper, opening it and reading in big letters, Jesus Christ will return on December 25th. What would we do? How would we react to this astonishing information? I think there would be two basic reactions. Some of us, out of fear perhaps, would change our lives immediately. The Lord is coming and we are not ready. Some might start attending a church more often, probably every day. Prayer would become a much higher priority in life. We would pray not only in the morning and evening, but many times a day. Isn't that so? We would seek reconciliation with that member of our family, the neighbor, the co-worker, and certainly with God. Others, however, might have a different response. Some of us might do nothing differently. Some in a defeatist attitude might say, well, there is nothing I can do at this late hour. God has already decided my fate. I might as well continue what I have been doing all along. There are others who might not change a thing that they are doing, but not in a defeatist mode. Some of us hopefully would say, isn't this the event for which the world has been waiting? Possession of such a, um, an attitude would allow us to continue doing what we have always been doing, confident that our preparations have been sound. The problem is, though, that no newspaper will announce the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ or the date when we will depart this life. To deal with this situation, Jesus said in verse 35, Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midday or at cock crow or at dawn. Jesus stated that we must keep awake, for we do not know when he who is the master of the house, will return. In other words, my sisters and brothers, he can come at any time, at an hour when we do not expect him. And this hour could come when we are indulging in things that are contrary to the will of God. He says he will come as a thief in the night, Therefore, we should be prepared at all times. The Apostle Paul tells us the, the exact same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2-5. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then a sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. If Christ is coming at an unexpected hour, how then should we respond? In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 6, Paul says to us, Let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake 
and be sober. My sisters and brothers, I do believe that many of us, even those who attend churches, have fallen asleep. I do believe that a lot of us have fallen asleep. The very thing that the scriptures has warned us not to do. Let us not fall asleep as others do. But we are supposed to keep awake. We are supposed to be prepared every single minute. Jesus told us how to live until he returns. We must watch for him. We must work diligently and consistently and obey his commands. And this is what our sister did. None of us knows when he will return. All we are sure of is that he will return. And so we are reminded in St. John 14 verse 3, which says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So don't think that God's coming at an unexpected time is meant to trap or to deceive us. You know, my sisters and brothers, the, the, the Lord has delayed his coming so that persons, more persons, can be saved. Second Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand the slowness, but he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There are persons here who perhaps have not repented of your sins. And it is for persons like yourself that Jesus has delayed his return. Many have not given their lives to the Lord as yet because they say that they are not ready. You know, even recently I was speaking with someone and the person said, I am not ready. Many have not given their lives to the Lord as yet because they say they are not ready. And they think that there is enough time left to be ready. You know, sometimes not only our young people, but even adults at times make excuses. And the youth will say that they are too young. And others will say that they want to enjoy life. But this soft afternoon, my dear friends, God is saying that you don't have time. Time is not yours. You know, in the scriptures, he said, young man, I call upon you because you are strong. While we have good health and strength, we need to serve the Lord. Amen. We need to serve the Lord. Some persons only want to come to church when they're on the stick already. But God wants us when we are young, when we are vibrant, when we have some energy. God wants to use us, my sisters and brothers. Don't wait until you are old and can't make it out anymore. We need to channel our energies into doing the things of God. And these things include committing and dedicating our lives to God. Getting involved in the activities of the church, witnessing to others, and taking care of our own spiritual needs. All this is part of our preparation for his return. Before his return, we have time to live what we believe, as well as to reflect his love and live with each other. The slaves were left in charge, and each given work to do, while they await the return of the master. So while waiting for the return of their master, um, they were expected to actively engage in work. Our master, my dear sisters and brothers, he has left. And while we await his return, we are expected to actively engage in work. Jesus has left us in charge of his possessions. And these possessions include our own lives and how we live it, as well as the lives of our children and other persons under our care. One day we will have 
to give an account of our stewardship. God will not hold us responsible for the gifts he has not given to us. But we who are his creation, we are all blessed with enough to keep us busy till he returns. We may receive an immediate reward for our faithfulness, but this does not always happen. As humans, we are weak, and we may be tempted to boast and do good for only what we can get, and not because we are sincere. The most accurate reflection of what we have done will be our heavenly rewards. Ephesians 6 verse 8 says, the Lord will reward everyone for whatever he does. Our dear sister, she did her best while she was alive. And we know that there is a reward awaiting her. But what will your reward be? What will be our reward? As we ponder this sobering scripture today, there are two questions I would like us to reflect on. Firstly, what responsibility do we have to assist others as Christians, those who are Christians, in their readiness for the Lord? Sister Welsh, she used the opportunities she got to witness to others. She was not about just coming to church Sunday, leaving, going home, then coming to prayer meeting on a Wednesday. But wherever she went, I am told that she witnessed to other persons as well. While waiting on the Lord, she was of use to others. You know, many of us are so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly use. But we cannot be satisfied that we have prepared ourselves and left others to their own devices. If we have the ability to be present, to give advice, to assist people in their daily preparation for the Lord, then as God's people, we must so act. The second question is, what preparations are necessary in my life to be fully ready for the coming of the Lord? We all need to take the, the, the sometimes perilous yet always necessary journey of introspection. And today, my sisters and brothers, is, uh, is a perfect day for us to reflect on where we are with Jesus Christ. The reality of death is right in front of us. And so we need to do introspection. Who am I and what does God ask of me as an individual? If God calls me this day, am I ready? Or is there unfinished business to which I must attend to make myself ready? We must do our best to feel secure in the presence of the Lord each day of our lives. And so, my dear sisters and brothers, I pray that we will take the, the words of the Lord seriously. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. I invite the congregation to please stand and those persons who are members of the, the Welsh's family to remain seated. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word to us this day. We thank you, God, that your words are very much alive. They are active, O oh God. We can relate to them. 
We thank you, God, that your words still continue to challenge us in this present day and age. Father, we pray that you will bless your word unto our hearts and may your name be glorified. Father, we stand in your presence even now, O oh God, and we bring before you the members of Sister Welsh's family. Most persons, Lord, are not here today because they are abroad. Father, we pray, Lord, that even as they have joined us online, O oh God, and there are persons here in this chapel, that you, dear God, will be with this family. We pray, dear God, that they will seek to live their lives as their loved one did, a life of total surrender and commitment to you, Almighty God, a life that was one lived in ministry, O oh God, to other persons, not just within the context of the church, but even outside of the church, O oh God. We pray, dear God, that even as they reflect on her and the ways in which she would have carried herself, that family members, O oh God, will seek to emulate her. We pray, dear God, that you will strengthen them even in this moment. We know, dear God, that death is expected. And yes, Lord, we know that as persons gradually reach a particular age, that's what we look forward to. But even then, O oh God, nothing or no one can replace our loved ones when they go. And so we know, O oh God, that family members have mixed feelings in this moment. But we pray, dear God, that they will be comforted because, Lord, they can have that hope that all is well with Sister Welsh. She lived for you and she died for you. We pray, dear God, that in the coming days, the bond of unity will be among the family, O oh God. That, Father, that bond of friendship and love, Lord, will be with them. We pray, dear God, that even as they themselves contemplate their own lives, that where possible, Lord, or where needed, that they too, O oh God, will indeed look to you, look to you for guidance, look to you, O oh God, for the inspiration that they need to carry on. And so into your hands, O oh God, we place them even now. May you continue to watch over them. May your blessings fall on them. May your anointing fall afresh on them. This I pray in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Please remain standing. Everyone, could you please stand for the Apostles' Creed as we reaffirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our prayers of thanksgiving. Praise be to you, O God, our Father. Praise and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, our Lord and our God. Praise and blessing be to you, O Holy Spirit, God, our Comforter. Together, all praise and glory, blessing and honor, thanksgiving and worship be to you, O Blessed Trinity. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. We bless your name for the life of Sister Welch, whom we today lay to rest. We give you thanks for the joy and the blessing her life has brought to others, for her service to her generation according to your will, and for every happy remembrance of her life. We bless you for your mercy and goodness which have followed her all the days of her life, that now the trials of this world are over and the death itself is past. Receive her into your perfect kingdom and bring us with all who have lived and died and served you faithfully to the fullness of your eternal joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please remain seated as we sing the hymn, When Peace Like a River Attendeth My Way.
obeyed us all, and hate nothing that you have made, and have given your Son for our redemption, we commend your daughter, Hazel Welsh, to your perfect mercy and wisdom. Eternal rest grant unto her, and let perpetual light shine upon her. The Lord's Prayer. remain standing for the closing hymn, and can it be that I should gain?
the benediction. Now the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is well pleasing in his sight, to God to whom be the glory forever and ever, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.
neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We know that if this earthly house of our tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Since our sister Hazel has departed out of this life, an almighty God in his mercy has taken her to himself. We therefore commit her body to the ground dust to dust, ashes to ashes, earth to earth, ensure an certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, from henceforth, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so says the spirit, they rest from their labors. O oh, merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, raise us up, we pray, from the death of sin to the new life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we shall be found acceptable in your sight. Grant to the bereaved consolation and faith in this time of distress and trial, the blessed hope in the coming of your kingdom, the sustaining grace in the fellowship of your people, and steadfastness in the service of your name and the doing of your will. Support us, O Lord, all the day long of this troublous life until the shadows lengthen, the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, Grant unto us safe lodging and holy rest at the last, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious
benediction and now may the grace of our lord and savior jesus christ the love of god the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all now and forevermore amen and amen Death.